In the Pleistocene epoch, megafauna reigned supreme. Many strange, curious animals existed then, like the Zygoglossus and the notorious killer kangaroo, but one stood out from them all, the giant short-faced kangaroo, Procoptodon goliath. Procoptodon goliath was the largest leaf-eating kangaroo of its time, and for that reason, many believe it to have resided in a forest habitat. While the precise distribution and abundance of this massive creature is a mystery, this kangaroo flourished over much of Australia until about 40,000 years ago. Areas where Procoptodon goliath was most likely to live in are highlighted in dark red, transposed on top of areas where forests exist today, or fossil sites where Procoptodon has been found. However, it is important to note that Procoptodon could have been found in the white areas on the map as well, as forests may have been present there during the Pleistocene epoch, but not today. Why are the forests now and in the megafauna period so different? We will have to observe the timeline of events that occurred from the megafauna period to now to understand this. In the Pleistocene epoch, 1.6 to 1.8 million years ago, the climate in Australia was becoming drier and drier. Lush rainforests, which probably spurred the growth of the megafauna, gave way to sclerophyll forests, which were better adapted to the dry climate. Some fauna which dwelt in forest habitats became disadvantaged, and more animals evolved to live in grassland regions. The flora in Australia stabilizes and adapts to the dry climate. However, due to multiple ice ages that cause alternating patterns of cold, dry weather and hot, wet weather, the distribution of forests, grassland and desert is continually shifting. These same ice ages also expose land bridges periodically, and this may have allowed humans to reach Australia 50,000 years ago. Man had a huge negative impact on the flora and fauna of Australia, such as reducing rainforests only 1% of the land mass, and soon the megafauna became extinct. Fires caused by both man and lightning also destroy many forests, leaving only fire-adapted flora like eucalyptus. After Pleistocene, the Holocene epoch begins. The climate becomes wetter for 5,000 years, then continues to dry. Modern-day creatures evolve or arrive on Australia. 200 years ago, European settlers arrive, and they radically change patterns of vegetation and animal life with farming and introduced species. Many creatures become extinct or endangered especially plants, resulting in an Australia of less forest than before. Procoptodon goliath is part of the Stenurinae subfamily, which means short-faced kangaroos. It is surprising then that its closest extant relative is not a kangaroo. It is instead the banded hair wallaby, Lagostrophus fasciatus, the only living creature still in the Stenurinae classification. There are some interesting similarities between the short-faced kangaroo and the hair wallaby. Firstly, they both have similar hind feet. Both have long plantigrade feet with few distinct toes. Fossils have been discovered that show the Procoptodon goliath had hind legs with a single toe ending in a hoof fly claw on each leg. The extant marsupial, the banded hair wallaby, however, has three toes, two of which are fused together, giving the impression of few toes. Next, they have similar teeth and facial structure. Both lack canines, possessing only incisors and molars. Procoptodon was also observed to have a short face with blunt front teeth, relative to today's kangaroos. The banded hair wallaby also appears to have a shortened face that has resulted in their two lower incisors bearing directly on the arc of the upper incisors, like the Procoptodon. Their molar row is straight and flat, with all teeth occluding concurrently. The small premolar moves forward during its life, so the diastema becomes progressively shorter, again like the Procoptodon. Thirdly, both species possess relatively short tails and large muscled hind legs. This would probably be related to their form of locomotion. Their tails provide balance to the creatures and extra traction when hopping. Despite these similarities, the two animals bear some obvious differences. First, the Procoptodon goliath was much larger and heavier than today's banded hair wallaby. The goliath is predicted to have grown up to 3 meters tall and weighed up to 200 kilograms. In contrast, a banded hair wallaby can only reach 0.8 meters tall and weighs 100 times less at an average of 1.7 kilograms. This was probably due to the fact that the goliath lived in a time when food was abundant and hence it grew to large proportions. In contrast, the hair wallaby's small size will allow it to survive longer should a food shortage occur in today's harsher climate. The Procoptodon goliath was also bipedal. It would have been on its hind legs most of the time. In contrast, banded hair wallabies are observed in a quadrupedal position most of the time. Finally, Procoptodon goliath also had very long arms and its paws had fingers with hooked claws and it could use these hands to grasp objects. It is predicted that the goliath obtained food from higher branches using these hands. This is a direct contrast to the wallaby, which has relatively short arms, which are not used to obtain food in the same manner. Could the climate alone have resulted in such differences in the goliath and the hair wallaby? The megafaunan climate was different as firstly, it is a lot drier today. Ever since the start of the Pleistocene epoch, the megafauna age, the entire world is becoming drier and drier. 
especially as Australia continues to move north. Rainfall in Australia is rarer today than in the megafauna period. Fires today are much more frequent than in the megafauna period due to increased dryness of the land, such that a single lightning bolt can settle fire. Temperatures are more homologous in the megafauna period, with cold seasons and hot seasons having similar temperatures. Today, Australia experiences increased seasonality. Cold seasons are colder and hot seasons are warmer. One similarity of the two climates, though, is that global climatic shifts like El Nino and La Nina have similar effects of increased and reduced temperature and rainfall. The Procoptodon golia of Australia could have been compared with a similar megafauna in North America, Jefferson's ground sloth, Megalonyx jeffersoni. While they may look dissimilar, there were some startling similarities between them. First, both are estimated to have reached an average height of 3 meters tall. They were probably both bipedal to some extent, as the Goliath's leg bone structure indicates it was probably standing or hopping most of the time, and the Jeffersonese hip bone shape indicates they could stand up to eat tree leaves. Both are also believed to be herbivores. Jeffersoni had teeth that were small and blunt, in keeping with the idea of a herbivore diet. However, Procoptodon had a short face and a deep skull that provided a powerful mechanical advantage of their chewing muscles, allowing it to eat tough leaves and stems. Gulaya and Jeffersoni also both had plantigrade feet, and probably the same way of obtaining food. Procoptodon is believed to have stood on its hind legs and propped itself up with its tail, using its aforementioned hands to take food from high branches. Jeffersoni also propped itself up in a semi-standing position on its flat feet using its tail, and then it used its hand-like claws to obtain food from high branches. One obvious difference though would be that Jeffersoni claws were much larger than Goliath claws. Goliath claws were probably used to pull tree branches down and eat off the branches, while Jeffersoni claws could be used to strip bark off branches and even cut them down. Another difference would be while Jefferson's sloth could stand in a bipedal position, particularly to obtain food, it would have moved around in a quadrupedal position. The two outer digits on its front claws, which correspond to our ring and little fingers, were modified to help bear the animal's massive weight on all fours. In contrast, the structure of the Procoptodon's leg bones show evidence of dense musculature that would allow it to jump. Procoptodon was probably more bipedal than the Jefferson sloth. Difference number 3, Jeffersonly also had 5 claw-like toes on each of its hind feet, with the central tree being well developed, presumably allowing greater stability and mobility to the sloth. In contrast, Goliath only had one hoof-like claw on each foot. Finally, Jefferson's ground sloth is also much heavier than the short-faced kangaroo. It is estimated that the maximum weight for the sloth reached up to 360 kilograms. The kangaroo, by contrast, had an estimated maximum weight of 200 kilograms or less. Why and how did the huge Australian megafauna become extinct? It was probably due to a combination of climate change and human predation. During the last glaciation in the Pleistocene epoch, temperatures in Australia fell, precipitation, also known as rainfall, decreased and Australia became more arid. Humans in the same period hunted megafauna which were easy prey and provided a lot of food. Water in Australia became sparse and the change in climate caused some wooded areas to become arid and suffer a loss in plant life. Less nutritious xeromorphic plants, not unlike cacti today, replace much for flora. Humans burning forests to hunt animals that fed on the regrowth also resulted in a loss of habitat for the animals. Fossil records suggest that megafauna were constrained by the area their food grew in, around the shrinking inland lakes or moist areas close to the East Australian seaboard. Increased competition between megafauna and these smaller areas Combined with the predation on megafauna by humans resulted in the death of large mammalian fauna. This affected their predators and resulted in a trophic collapse and further extinctions. Deposits unearthed from megafauna site at Lansfield Swamp, Victoria, provide evidence in support of climate change, along with biological, isotopic and geological evidence of cyclic quaternary temperature and precipitation that has been accurately dated. Carbon deposits evidence the frequent fires that are used long ago by humans for hunting. The reasons Australian fauna today are quite different from fauna on other continents are probably due to genetic drift and natural selection. Genetic drift occurs when a group of individuals leaves a population and establishes a new one in a geographically isolated region. Marsupials are believed to have evolved in North America 80 million years ago and a portion of them travelled down to South America and moved through Antarctica to reach Australia. Monotremes followed a similar path from South America to Australia. Later, in the Eocene epoch 55 million years ago, the landmass that would become Australia broke away from Antarctica and was isolated from the other continents. 
The fauna there was hence free from competition with placentals, which were developing and out-competing marsupials on neighbouring continents. Marsupials and monotremes are then believed to have outcompeted the placentals in Australia, unlike elsewhere in the world, and placentals there died out due to natural selection, leaving only marsupials and monotremes.